hello everyone i hope you are doing well it is christy and because my computer has been lagging so badly i thought that what i would do is record the book chapter and then uh upload it and i'm sorry i can't do it with you live but at least this way we get to stay on time also just to say i um already went through this entire chapter but i messed up because instead of hitting start recording i hit start streaming but then i never went live so i just pretended to talk to an audience for half an hour. But uh, let's go ahead and get on with chapter two. It is very interesting. I won't say too much, mostly because I already watched it um, and read it before this, so this will be my third time through. But we're doing this together, so we have a reason. We're showing up, we're reading buddies, and we're going to do this as one. All right, so, um, oh, that reminds me. I think I need to put on my headphones because I think the sound is going to need to come through here. So, yes, uh, we're on chapter two on rational scientific, like objectivism and imaginary, like uh, objective standpoints. And ugh, I should have done this. I really should have done this before I started streaming. Uh, come on, Christy, get your stuff together. Open sound settings. Here we go. You know, I'm not even going to edit this out. I'm just going to leave this in. All right, headphones, let's go. Chapter two. Chapter two. On rational, scientific, objective viewpoints from mythical, imaginary, impossible standpoints. In 2012, 20 kindergarten children and six adults were shot and killed at an elementary school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. In the wake of this tragedy, and the weight of others like it, the design firm Periscopic started a new project to visualize gun deaths in the United States. While there is no shortage of prior work in the form of bar charts or line graphs of deaths per year, Periscopic, a company whose tagline is Do Good With Data, took a different approach. When you load the web page, you see a single, arcing line that reaches out over time. Then, the color abruptly shifts from orange to white. A small dot drops down, and you see the phrase, Alexander Lipkins, killed at 29. The arc continues to stretch across the screen, coming to rest on the x-axis, where you see a second phrase, could have lived to be 93. Then, a second arc appears, displaying another arcing life. The animation speeds up over time, and the arcing lines increase, along with a counter that displays how many years of life have been stolen from these gun victims. After a couple of, long, minutes, the visualization moves through all of the year 2013, arriving at 11,419 people killed and 502,025 stolen years. Okay, I'm going to pause so we can... Okay, oh, this is the image. This is the one line right here that's arcing through. It's kind of hard to see because of the PDF, but you can see each of these lines is an individual and when their lives were cut short. So tragic. Uh, in contrast, this is... Number of active shooter incidents annually. Just a purple graph with uh, single and double digit numbers. What is different about Periscopic's visualization than a more conventional bar chart of similar information such as the era of active shooters from the Washington Post? The Post's graphic has a proposition that active shooter incidents are on the rise and demonstrates visual evidence to that effect. But Periscopic's work is framed around a singular emotion, loss. People are dying, their remaining time on earth has been stolen from them. These people have names and ages. We presume they have parents and partners and children who also suffer from that loss. The data scientists who worked on the project used rigorous statistical methods and demographic information in order to infer how long that person would have lived, which are documented in their notes. But in spite of the statistical rigor and its undeniable emotional impact, U.S. gun deaths drew mixed responses from the visualization community. They couldn't decide, should a visualization evoke emotion? The received wisdom in technical communication circles is, emphatically, an O. In the recent book, A Unified Theory of Information Design, the authors state, the plain style normally recommended for technical visuals is directed toward a deliberately neutral emotional field, a blank page in effect, upon which viewers are more free to choose their own response to the information. Here, plainness is equated with the absence of design, and thus greater freedom on the part of the viewer to interpret the results for themselves. Things like colors and icons, it is implied, work only to stir up emotions and cloud the viewer's rational mind. In fact, in the field of data visualization, any kind of ornament has historically been viewed as suspect. Why? Well, as historian of science Theodore Porter puts it, quantification is a technology of distance and distance was historically imagined. Pause. To serve objectivity by producing knowledge independently of the people that make it. Can I just point out, like, when you make the decision to remove all emotional context or emotional uh, art or visualizations from... A display of data that's a choice that's an aesthetic choice and it's an emotional choice 
you just think your emotional choice is superior because it's coming from a place of neutrality. But shouldn't we have a visceral reaction to shooters, mass death, people losing their lives? Those are tragedies. Those are sad things. So why would we want to strip them of that emotion? This echoes 19th century statistician Carl Pearson's exhortation for people to set aside their own feelings and emotions when it came to statistics. The more seemingly neutral, the more rational, the more true, the better. At a data visualization master class in 2013, workshop leaders from the Guardian newspaper called Spreadsheet Data, those endless columns and rows, clarity without persuasion. Back in the olden days of visualization, before the rise of the web elevated the visual display of data into a prized, and increasingly pervasive, art form, Edward Tuft, statistician and statistical graphics expert, invented a metric for measuring the superfluous information included in a chart, what he called the data ink ratio. In his view, a visualization designer should strive to use ink only to display the data. Any ink devoted to something other than the data itself, such as background color, iconography, or embellishment, should be immediately erased and, he all but says, the designer spat upon. Visual minimalism, according to this logic, appeals to reason first. Just the facts, ma'am, says Joe Friday, to every female character on Dragnet. Decorative elements, on the other hand, are associated with messy feelings, or, worse, represent stealthy, and, of course, unscientific, attempts at emotional persuasion. Data visualization has even been classified as the unempathetic art, in the words of designer Mushin Zuraviv, because of its emphatic rejection of emotion. The gendered dimension of this thinking should be as clear as when President Richard Nixon, in a now infamous statement, declared that no woman should be in any government job, because they are erratic. And emotional. He subsequently admitted that men are erratic and emotional, too, but insisted that a woman is more likely to be. Yeah, just ask Donald Trump that. We saw the same sentiment play out in the presidential debates of 2016 between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, but it's not limited to politics alone. The truth is that most Anglo-Western cultures have long prized reason over emotion for its supposedly greater neutrality and universality. Now, it, when it comes to data collection, it is very important to collect all relevant data without introducing bias, or at least as much as possible, right? Because there's always things you're going to have to leave out. There are always some definitions you're going to choose to operationalize, in other words, to use to frame how you measure things, and others that you can't. Um, but the point of neutrality in data collection is to test your model so you know whether or not your your ideas of what's happening in the real world, the causal relationships you suspect are at work, are really there. And so, um, you know, not having bias in your data collection is different from saying you can't ever have an emotional reaction to the data that you've collected. And the belief that women are more emotional than men, and, by contrast, that men are more reasoned than women, is one of the most persistent stereotypes in the world today. Indeed, psychologists have called it the master stereotype, and puzzled over how it endures even when certain emotions, even extreme ones, like anger and pride, are simultaneously coded as male. One need only compare any number of Hulk smash gifts to the equal number of crazy lady PMS memes floating around the internet to prove, first of all, that everyone is crazy, and second, that the stereotype of the unstable, irrational woman persists. But what happens if we let go of the binary logic for a minute and posit two questions to challenge this master stereotype? First, is visual minimalism really more neutral? And second, how might activating emotion asterisk asterisk, leveraging it, rather than resisting emotion in data visualization, mm. help us learn, remember, and communicate with data? Until recently, data visualization was a rather specialized form of communication. Pause while I scroll. More common in scientific papers and earnings reports than on the front page of the New York Times. Because of this history, the field's theorists and practitioners have come from technical disciplines aligned with engineering and computer science, and have not been mm. trained in the most fundamental of all Western communication theories, rhetoric. In the ancient Greek treatise of the same name, Aristotle defines rhetoric as the faculty of observing, in any given case the available means of persuasion. Rhetoric does not, only, consist of political speeches made by men in robes on ancient stages. Any communicating object that makes choices about the selection and representation of reality is a rhetorical object. Whether or not it is rhetorical, it is, has nothing to do with whether or not it is true, it may or may not be. Why does the question of rhetoric matter? Well, because a rhetorical dimension is present in every design, as Jessica Holman, a researcher at the University of Washington, says of data visualization. This includes visualizations that do not deliberately intend to persuade people of a certain message. We would say that it especially and definitively includes those so-called neutral visualizations that do not appear to have an editorial hand. In fact, those might even be the most perniciously persuasive visualizations of all. Holman and co-author Nicholas Diakopoulos wrote an influential paper in 2011 introducing concepts of rhetoric to the information visualization community. 
Their main argument is that visualizing data involves editorial choices. Some things are necessarily highlighted, while others are necessarily obscured. When designers make these choices, they carry along with them framing effects, which is to say they have an impact on how people interpret the graphics and what they take away from them. For example, it is standard practice to cite the source of one's data. This functions on a practical level, so that a reader may go out and download the data themselves. But this choice also functions as what Holman and Diakopoulos call provenance rhetoric designed to signal the transparency and trustworthiness of the presentation source to end users. Yeah, one of the things I'll always do when someone presents me with a chart is I'll look for the data source. And if I don't see one, I'm like, yep, this, yep, can't do this. It's probably made up. This trust between the designers and their audience, in turn, increases the likelihood that viewers will believe what they see. So if plain, unemotional visualizations are not neutral, but are actually extremely persuasive, then what does this mean for the concept of neutrality in general? Scientists and journalists are just some of the people that get nervous and defensive when questions about neutrality and objectivity come up. Auditors and accountants get nervous, too. They often assume that the only alternative to objectivity is a retreat into complete relativism and a world in which everyone gets a medal for having an opinion. But feminists would beg to differ. Feminists, generally speaking, do not like alternative facts any more than scientists do. Rather than valorizing the neutrality ideal, feminist thinkers like Sandra Harding would posit a different kind of objectivity that strives for truth at the same time that it considers, and discloses, the standpoint of the designer. This has come to be called standpoint theory. It is defined by what Harding calls strong objectivity, which acknowledges that regular grade, vanilla. Scrolling. Objectivity is mainly made by mostly rich mm -hmm. white guys in power and does not include the experiences of women and other marginalized groups. This myopia inherent in traditional objectivity is what provoked renowned cardiologist Dr. Nika Goldberg to title her book Women Are Not Small Men, because she found that heart disease in women unfolds in a fundamentally different way than in men. The vast majority of scientific studies, not just of heart disease, but of most medical conditions, are conducted on male subjects, with women viewed as varying from this norm only by their smaller size. Mm -hmm. Harding and her followers would say that the key to fixing this issue is to acknowledge that all science, and indeed all work in the world, is undertaken by individuals, each with a particular standpoint, gender, race, culture, heritage, life experience, and so on. Rather than viewing these standpoints as threats that might bias our work, for, after all, even the standpoint of a rich white guy in power is a standpoint, mm -hmm. we should embrace Elon each Musk. of our standpoints as valuable perspectives that can frame our work. Our diverse standpoints can generate creative and wholly new research questions. We discuss standpoint theory further in Unicorns, Janitors, Ninjas, Wizards, and Rock Stars, where we assert that a participatory process that centers the standpoints of those most marginalized is what makes for strong objectivity. Along with this embrace of our various standpoints goes the rebalancing of the false binary between reason and emotion. Point one, since the early 2000s, there has been an explosion of research about effect, the term that academics use to refer to emotions and other subjective feelings, from fields as diverse as neuroscience, geography, and philosophy. This work challenges the thinking, inherited from Descartes, which casts emotion as irrational and illegitimate, even as it undeniably influences all of the social and political processes of our world. Feminist thinkers have long believed that emotion, and other forms of subjective experiences, are legitimate ways of knowing and producing knowledge about the world. Evelyn Fox Keller, mm -hmm. a physicist turned philosopher, famously employed the Nobel Prize winning research of geneticist Barbara McClintock, in order to show how even the most profound of scientific discoveries are generated from a combination of experiment and insight, reason and emotion. And sociologist Patricia Hill Collins describes an ideal knowledge situation as one in which neither ethics nor emotions are subordinated to reason. Once we embrace the idea of leveraging emotion in data visualization, we can truly appreciate what sets Periscopic's gun deaths apart from the Washington Post graphic, or any number of other gun death charts that have appeared in newspapers and policy documents. The Washington Post graphic represents death counts as blue ticks on a generic bar chart. If we didn't read the caption, we wouldn't know whether we were counting gun deaths in the U.S., or haystacks in Kansas, or exports from Malaysia, or any other semi-remote statistics of passing interest. But the periscopic visualization leads with loss, grief, and scrolling. Morning. It provides a visual language for representing the years that could have been, numbers that are accurate, but not technically facts. It uses pacing and animation to help us appreciate the scale of one life, and then compounds that scale 11,419 fold. The magnitude of the loss, especially when viewed in aggregate, is a staggering and profound truth, and the visualization helps recognize it as such through our own emotions. The generic WALPO bar chart cannot do the work of communicating this truth. Skilled data artists and designers know these things already, and are pushing the boundaries for what effective and embodied data visualization could look like. In 2010, Kelly Dobson founded the Data Visualization Research Group at the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, Digital Plus Media Graduate Program. The goal for this group was not to visualize data, but to visceralize it. 
Visual things are for the eyes, but visualizations are data that the whole body can experience, emotionally, as well as physically. The reasons for doing visualizing data have to do with more than simply creative experimentation. How do visually impaired people access charts and dashboards? According to the World Health Organization, 253 million people globally live with some form of visual impairment. This might include cataracts, glaucoma, and complete blindness. Creators in the visualization mode have crafted haptic data visualizations, two data walks, data quilts, musical scores from scientific data, wearable objects that capture your breaths and play them back later, and data performances. These types of objects and events are more likely to be found in the context of galleries and museums and research labs, but there are many lessons to be learned from them for those of us who make visualizations in more everyday settings. For example, in the project A Sort of Joy, Thousands of Exhausted Things, a theater troupe joined with a data visualization firm to craft a live performance based on metadata about the artworks held by New York's Museum of Modern Art. With 123,951 works in its collection, MoMA's metadata consists of the names of artists, the titles of artworks, their media formats, and their time periods. But how does an artwork make it into the museum collection to begin with? Major art museums and their collection policies have long been the focus of feminist critique because the question of whose work gets collected translates into the question of whose work is counted in the annals of history. Mm -hmm. And, as you might guess, this history has mostly consisted of a parade of white male masters. Mm -hmm. In 1989, for example, the Guerrilla Girls, an anonymous collective of female artists, published what we would today call an infographic, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met? Museum? The graphic was designed to be displayed on a billboard. However, it was rejected by the sign company because it wasn't clear enough. If you ask us, it's pretty clear. The Gorilla Girls then paid. Pause as I scroll, and there's the image. For it to be printed on posters which were displayed throughout the New York City bus system until the bus company canceled their contract, stating that the figure seemed to have more than a fan in her hand. It is definitely more than a fan. The figure is certainly provocative, but the poster also makes a data-driven argument by tabulating gender statistics for artists included in the Met collection and comparing them to the gender stats for the subjects of art included in the collection. As per the poster, the Met readily collects paintings in which women are the subjects, but not those in which women are the artists themselves. Mm -hmm. A Sort of Joy yep. tackles a similar subject, but with wholly different tactics. The performance starts with a group of white men standing in a circle in the center of the room. They face out towards the audience, which stands around them. The men are dressed like stereotypical museum visitors, collared shirts, slacks, etc. Each wears headphones and holds an iPad on which the names of artists in the collection scroll by. John, the men say together. We see the iPad scrolling through all of the names of artists in the MoMA collection, whose first name is John, John Baldessari, John Cage, John Lennon, John Waters, and so on. Three female performers, also wearing headphones and carrying iPads, with scrolling names, pace around the circle of men. Robert, the men say together, and the names scroll through the Roberts alphabetically. The women are silent and keep walking. David, the men say together. It soon becomes apparent that the artists are sorted by first name, and then ordered by which first name has the most works in the collection. Thus, the Johns and Roberts and Davids come first, because they have the most works in the collection. But Marys have fewer works, and Mohammeds and Camillas are barely in the register. Several minutes later, after the men say, Michael, James, George, Jean, Hans, Thomas, Walter, Edward, Yen, Joseph, Martin, Mark, Jose, Louis, Frank, Oz, Otto, Max, Stephen, Jack, Henry, Henri, Alfred, Alexander, Carl, Andre, Harry, Roger and Pierre, Mary finally gets her due. It's spoken by the female performers, the first sound they've made. For audience members, the experience starts as one of slight confusion. Why are there men in a circle? Why do they randomly speak someone's name? And what are those women walking around so intently? But Mary becomes a kind of aha moment, the same that researcher Robert Cosera says that data visualization is so good at producing, when the highly gendered nature of the collection is revealed. Mm -hmm. From that point on, audience members start to listen differently, eagerly awaiting the next female name. It takes more than three minutes for Mary to be spoken, and the next female name, Joan, doesn't come for a full minute longer. Barbara follows immediately after that, and then the men return to reading, Werner, Tony, Marcel, Jonathan. From a data analysis perspective, a sort of joy consists of simple operations, only counting and grouping. The results could easily have been represented by a bar chart or a tree mm -hmm. map of first names. But rendering the data set as a time-based experience makes the audience wait and listen. It also contradicts long-held wisdom in visualization design, as expressed by Ben Schneiderman in the mid-1990s, overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand. Instead, in this data performance, we do not see the whole picture. We hear and see and experience each data point one at a time. The different gender expressions, body movements, and verbal tones of the performers draw our collective attention to the issue of gender in the MoMA collection. 
We start to anticipate when the next female name will arise, and begin to speculate on whether it will be a Rosa, a Rhonda, or another name entirely. We feel the gender differential, rather than see it. This feeling is a fact. It comprises the emotions that arise when experiencing the performance and the physiological reactions to, to the sounds and movements made by the performers, as well as the desires and drives that result, even if that drive is to walk into another room because the performance is disconcerting or just plain long. Designing data visualizations requires a much more holistic conception of the viewer. The viewer isn't just a pair of eyes attached to a brain. Mm -hmm. They are a whole body, a complex, feeling one. Theirs is a body located in space, with a history and a future. This notion of the visceral viewer, and of the additional knowledge that can be conveyed when designing with visceralization in mind, can be found in many current projects, even if they don't always describe their work in those terms. For example, Catherine, one of the authors of this book, and artist Andy Sutton led walking tours of the future coastline of Boston based on sea level rise. And Lauren, the other author, and her team of Georgia Tech undergrads recreated Elizabeth Peabody's living room rug-sized charts from the 19th century using touch sensors and individually addressable LEDs. Mikhail Manchin made a leaning, bobbing chair that animatronically shifts, based on real-time shifts in river currents. Terry Rube staged sound encounters between the geologic layers of a landscape and the human body that is affected by them. Scrolling. Simon Elvins drew a giant paper map of silence in London that you can actually listen to. While these projects may seem to be speaking to another part of brain than your standard Sankey diagrams or network maps, there is something to be learned from the opportunities opened up by visceralizing data. In fact, scientists are now proving by experiment what designers and artists have long known through practice, activating emotion, leveraging embodiment, and creating novel presentation forms help people learn more from data-driven arguments and remember them more fully. It's true. We tend to remember things as stories. You know, stories is a way of understanding the world, and it's the most basic foundational way of communicating information is to have some sort of story. Just showing people random facts without a story around those facts, they'll just slide off their brain. But if you tell them a story with the data, they'll remember the story and the data go along with the story. It turns out that visualizing data may also help designers solve a pernicious problem in the visualization community, how to represent uncertainty in a medium that's become rhetorically synonymous with the truth. Its truthiness is both a feature and a bug. One of the best things about data visualization is that it does look so certain, so factual, and so authoritative. But why? After doing a sociological analysis, Helen Kennedy determined that four conventions of data visualization reinforce people's perceptions of its factual basis. One, two-dimensional viewpoints. Two, clean layouts. Three, geometric shapes and lines. And four, the inclusion of data sources at the bottom. These conventions contribute to the perception of data visualization as objective, scientific, and neutral. But even if you use these conventions with the best and most pure intentions, it's something of a problem for feminist design, because feminist theory maintains that there is no such thing as a purely objective view of the world. Knowledge is always partial, as mm -hmm. Sandra Harding has shown us, and these conventions would seem to contradict that basic philosophical tenet. Haraway's God trick, which we discuss in Bring Back the Bodies, is exactly that, a trick to make you believe that you can see everything, all at once, from an imaginary and impossible standpoint. This is the argument from philosophy, but representing uncertainty is also a known problem in data journalism and visualization research. In these realms, people may care a tiny bit less about feminist epistemology, but do care deeply about end users' ability to accurately interpret graphic depictions of data and use them to make decisions. To this end, designers have created a huge array of charts and techniques for quantifying and representing uncertainty. These include box plots, violin plots, gradient plots, and confidence intervals. Unfortunately, however, people are terrible at recognizing uncertainty in data visualizations, mm -hmm. even when they're explicitly told that something is uncertain. According to work by Jeff Cumming and colleagues, researchers themselves have a hard time understanding confidence intervals. And even everyday weather forecasts such as there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow are generally interpreted by the public to mean it will rain 30% of the time or it will rain in 30% of my area. 3. Emotion is not only useful for communicating uncertainty. Let's return to... Pause as I scroll. All right. Oh, there we, I know because I already read this. This is um, uncertainty bars around some sort of longitudinal study. And it just sort of like has the very similar bar margins all the way through. So it doesn't really tell you much, to be honest. The question around visual minimalism. Are minimal charts really better? As Edward Tuft has claimed, charts like Monstrous Costs, depicted above, have been historically dismissed as chart junk. I don't remember Monstrous Costs. I don't, I don't remember seeing this anywhere. I don't, did they forget to put it in? I don't know. In this case, the data has to do with presidential campaign spending from 1972 to 1982. 
you will notice that there is a very low data to ink ratio, recall Tuft's other major pet peeve. For example, the monster's eyes and body would be deemed as not data and thus embellishment. Likewise, there is gratuitous spittle emanating from the monster's mouth, and the tail forms an S-curve that is then turned into a dollar sign with two utterly superfluous gray lines. The monster is also wearing a vote badge, which, again, does not represent any aspect of the data at hand. Plus, monsters do not vote, so how irrational is that? There are many popular blogs devoted to ridiculing this so-called chart junk. But recently, researchers have challenged the notion that chart junk is junk at all. A 2010 study by Scott Bateman and colleagues in computer science at the University of Saskatchewan that found that embellished charts do not hinder people's ability to accurately read them, and in fact, they are actually better for memorability. When polled two to three weeks later, people were much more likely to recall the message of the embellished chart over a minimalist chart that mm -hmm. displayed the same data. People also thought the junk charts were more attractive and enjoyed mm -hmm. them more, duh. Who doesn't like monsters better than bar charts? Likewise, in 2016, Michelle Borkin and colleagues showed that visualizations that make use of novel presentation styles are more memorable and therefore more effective. Relating the visual form to the topical content of a chart works. So, as data journalist Mona Chalabi says, if it's about farts, draw a butt, for God's sakes. Okay, scrolling down to the, skip the fluff. After all this, you might be wondering, so why is it that people like junk so much? But that is not really the right question. The question we should all be asking is, how has the view from an imaginary and impossible standpoint, the whole picture, the overview, come to be seen as rational and objective at all? The rational, scientific, objective viewpoint actually comes from a mythical, imaginary, impossible standpoint. The view from nobody. The god trick of seeing everything from nowhere, as Donna Haraway says it. But let's say it more simply, how did we arrive at conventions and data visualization that prioritize rationality, devalue emotion, and completely ignore the human body except for two eye stalks attached to a brain? I think it would be really interesting if the authors spent a bit more time adding the historical context, like tracing this back to the Enlightenment. How, you know, initially it was a really good f step away from the other way that we used to do knowledge production, which is if it was really old, somehow it was really good. In the ancient world, things that were old knowledge and passed on had a lot of authenticity and newfangled ideas were really skeptical, skeptically regarded, which is the opposite of what we have today. Um, but when the Enlightenment started to ground knowledge production in rationality and observation, that was a good step forward. The problem is if you get kind of stuck in that and you think that's the only way to do things, you, you stagnate. Any knowledge community inevitably places certain things at the center and casts others out, in the same way that male bodies have been taken as the norm mm -hmm. in scientific study and female bodies imagined as deviation from the norm, or that rationality has been valued as an authoritative mode of communication and emotion cast out. But, following feminist theorist Elizabeth Gross, what is regarded as excess in any given system might possibly be the most interesting thing to explore because it tells us the most about what and who the system is trying to exclude. In the case of data visualization, this excess is emotion and effect, embodiment and expression, embellishment and decoration. These are the aspects of human experience coded female, and thus devalued by the logic of our master stereotype. But how might we intentionally flip this? All design fields, including visualization, are fields of possibility. We must actively strive to question what, and who, is at the center of the discourse of our field, what, and who, is at the periphery. And then we must work to center the things, and people that have been cast off. The first step in this recentering process is to legitimize effect and embodiment in data visualization. This means to moving emotion to the center of visualization design, and to start to imagine data experiences for whole human bodies in all of their glorious, situated, uncontainable excesses. Scroll. Oh, that's end. Boom, we're done. That was fast. That um, ended weirdly. Uh, there was no closure. It just sort of stopped. And I kind of am a big fan of telling what you told them. Yeah, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. And uh, yeah, that was a, a really abrupt shock. So, but done within 30 minutes, even with me screwing up. How very exciting. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there and I will uh, move on to the next video probably tomorrow. But uh, yes, I look forward to seeing you in chapter three. So until the next time we see each other, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Have a great day wherever it is and whenever it is you are.